Well, good evening to you again. I'd like for you to turn in your notes, if you would, to uh, Hebrews chapter 3. We're beginning at the top of verse 8, and I want, I want us just to, uh, just, uh, uh, you can actually turn back to page 7, where we were talking about the word beware, uh, and Jesus is encouraging his disciples there in uh, Mark chapter 12 to beware of of the scribes uh, and so he uses this same word here and uh, the word beware is a word that means that you have to look out for something you have to be um, uh, you have to be uh, alert to things that are going on around you and in this case uh, he says that it's very possible that somebody if they are not in alignment with God's will and God's purposes, that they can depart from the living God. They can have a heart of, of unbelief. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. If you remember uh, in our last session in uh, class 8, we talked about the fact that uh, aphistema, the word for uh, beware here, is the word that we get um, our word apostasy from. And... Uh, an apostate is somebody who has previously subscribed to a certain belief, but they have renounced what it is that they have formerly believed. So, here's where we pick up uh, this evening. The point is that the word beware is a very, very strong word. It, it, it's, not a, it's not a minor word. It's not a, it's not a word that just has a... It's, it's not kind of a soft, tense word it's a it's a very very strong word in the greek language and it's associated with something desperately critical to understand i mean now just think about this for a minute how much more critical could it be for for us to understand uh, uh that a christian can depart from the living god a christian we're not talking about lost people departing from the living god that they can't depart from the living God because they're not a part of the living God. If you're going to be a part of Christ, uh, that, let's just take it in practical terms. There are a lot of people that leave the church. A lot of Christians that decide that they don't need to be faithful or committed to the church. No wonder he has to encourage them later not to forsake the assembling of themselves together. But you can't depart from something that you're not actually a part of. And so... The reason that these people can depart from the living God is because they are part of the living God. And it says here that they not only can do that, but they can do so with an evil heart of unbelief. Now, this is important, this little distinction that we're going to make here. And if you don't agree with what I'm going to say, you can go back. You can go back. I encourage you to go back, do your own study on it. You can come to your own conclusion. But I want you to appreciate that what we're going to say here and what we're going to teach about this heart of unbelief because somebody's going to say well you know how can a Christian have a heart of unbelief well just think about your own life just think about all the things that God would ask you to do things that you're not willing to do things that you know maybe God has wanted you to do and you didn't do or you had a heart of unbelief where you weren't willing to go where God wanted you to go, where you didn't do what God wanted you to do. But you're a believer. So a heart of unbelief is something here that has great application to, uh, I mean, its application in this text, in this context, is to a believer. And I would say that what, what is the governing factor in understanding the heart of unbelief or the difference between that and an unbelieving heart is the context in which those phrases are actually used. Okay? The context, whether it's in the Gospels and Jesus talking to somebody and they have an unbelieving heart, or here in the Hebrews and they're talking to a believer and they have a heart of unbelief. They're, they're two different terms, they have two different connotations, and the context in which they're used is what gover governs their interpretation. Remember, we've been saying that all along. Without context, there is no text. Or the context, without context, the text becomes just a pretext. So you have to understand, you have to appreciate that. What an evil heart of unbelief is referring to is the fact that the believer's heart is one in which the very evil of unbelief 
is still present. You know, we're going to get to a place there in uh, Hebrews 11. He says, without faith, it's impossible to even please God. Uh, wait, well, he's not talking to lost people. He's not talking to lost people there. He's talking about us. He's talking about me. Uh, and so we come to this, and here we have, that we know that in the believer's heart, there's some unbelief. There's some things that they're not willing to trust God in. And, and the more of those kind of pockets of unbelief that we have in our life, the, I think the tendency is that those things will grow. They will kind of uh, grow and sprout and, and have an influence on other areas of our life. It means that it is present, not just in a passive state, but it's in a state of active opposition. You, you've known people, I've known people, maybe you have uh, you know, different areas of your life where, where, uh, 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 where you just simply were not willing to do what God wanted you to do. You know, hopefully that's not something that's prevalent, or that's not a normal characteristic, it's not an ongoing characteristic of your life, but I think every one of us as, as, as believers can look back. I, I remember, I, I've shared with you previously about the time that God disciplined me I, when I was involved in another church for like 12 years. And six of those years, I'm just convinced. I don't think I should have been there to begin with. Uh, and then the last six years was just a constant reproof by God all my life. Uh, I did something that God didn't want me to do. I, I mean, I went out. I wasn't paying attention. I didn't. Do, I was still young in the Lord. I'm, I'm, I'm not using that as an excuse. I just I didn't do what God wanted me to do. I didn't do it biblically. I didn't do it. Uh, graciously, I wasn't kind about it. I was just, a, 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 I made a complete mess of the whole thing. You know? And I wasn't willing to do what I, I believe God wanted me to do at that point in my life. Was I a Christian? Absolutely. Was I saved? Absolutely I was. Was I in the middle of God's will? No, I wasn't. I was, I was, I, I had, I had just made a decision and God said, all right, I'm going to let you live with that decision. You can, if that's what you want to do, okay, go ahead. And so, and so, in other words, this unbelief is actively working to overcome the believer's faith in Christ. And unfortunately, the believer is allowing that to take place. But we have to be careful to b distinguish b between a heart in which unbelief is present and what the Bible actually calls an unbelieving heart. The two are very different. It's, it's subtle. And the context, when those... When those phrases are used, it's the context that's going to govern how you interpret that passage. We've been saying all along, from beginning to end, this book is talking to believers, brethren, holy brethren, partakers. You know, we're not talking to unbelievers here. We're talking to something that can happen in a believer's heart. The expression... Uh, uh, you, you know, the first may be true of a Christian, but not the second, not the, the idea of an unbelieving heart. The expression an unbelieving heart is distinctly referring to a heart that is solely and entirely controlled by unbelief. And if that case there, in that case there, there's no biblical faith in Christ whatsoever, and therefore no salvation. If somebody just has a completely unbelieving heart, they're not willing to believe, doesn't matter what you tell them, doesn't matter how many times you preach the gospel, it doesn't matter. You probably have people like that in your church, people that you've known, and they can sit there and hear the gospels. It could be your children, it could be members of your family, it could be friends, it could be people that you know, and they sit there week after week after week after week, they hear the gospel, they hear the word of God, and it means nothing to them. They never respond. There are just hundreds, thousands of people like that in churches all over, all over America, literally all over the world. And, it, and they just have a, an, an unbelieving heart. Their heart's not willing to believe. And that's different than a heart of unbelief where unbelief is present in an individual's life. The third imperative that we have here that's given is the word exhort in verse... 13, it says, but exhort one another daily while it is called today. It's the Greek word parakaleo, and it literally means to call near. And, and it means to call aloud. It means literally 
to utter in a loud voice. This is a strong word. In other words, if you take the meaning of it, if, if, if you go back and you do the research and you take the actual meaning of what this word exhort means, parakaleo, there are other words for encourage and all of that, but this particular word, the word para, uh, is added to the verb, and, and, and whenever you have a verb and you add a prefix to it, in most cases, what it's doing is that it's intensifying the meaning of that word in some way. One might be to call or to call near. You put the word para up before it, and it gives it, it gives it a different meaning. It intensifies the meaning. There's some, there are some uh, prefixes that may uh, soften the meaning, if I can say it that way. But this is a, this is a prefix that actually intensifies the meaning. And it gives it the stronger meaning of to call something urgently. You know, it's like this, this writer, he has this really pastoral heart. He recognizes that some things are going on in the life of these believers. And he just, it's like he wants to put out this urgent call to them. In other words, do what you have to do to get people's attention. You know, sometimes uh, if, I'm a, if I'm preaching on a Sunday morning, I don't do this very often, but there are times when I have, and I've done it purposely, and I've done it intentionally. If I, if I sense that during the message that there's a number of people out in the congregation that are just kind of drifting, and they're just, they're just not really paying attention and all that, there are times when I'll just raise my voice. I'll say something a little bit stronger. As I listen very, very carefully, and I'll say it that way. But why am I doing that? It's to get their attention. It's so that they can know that what we're talking about is important. To me, that's a, that's a characteristic that anybody that teaches the Word of God ought to... You know, if you're just going to be passive all the time, you know, just, just kind of passive, never, never raise your voice. I'm not talking about yelling at people. I'm not talking about banging your fist and, you know, just doing all of that. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about being sensitive to uh, what's going on while you're teaching. And uh, uh, there have been times, uh, uh, I, you know, I know where I've been in a class, especially in Romania, where we have 10 hours of class a day. And I may have the afternoon class for five hours and we just finished eating lunch and they got all this food in their stomach and their blood's going down here to kind of digest all the food and they eat a lot at lunch and so they come in at two o'clock, you know, and they're, they're doing everything they can to, to, to just maintain staying awake. I, I just, you know, we take a break every hour and for about five or ten minutes and uh, uh, I let them get up. Stand up. Uh, William, he stands up. Um, uh, I'll be teaching here, and William, just stand up, you know. Uh, if he feels like he's getting tired, you, it's, it's hard. Some, you know, uh, Dr. Ildefonso says it like this. He says, this can't endure any more than this can endure. And there's probably a great deal of truth to that. And so there are times when, when I'm teaching, and I just, uh, it's, I, I have something I want to say, and I do what I have to do to get my people's attention. Uh, I'll, I'll lean over. I, I'll, I'll say something. I'll say, uh, there, there are plenty of times I say, look up here for just a minute. Just look up here. And, and you know, and everybody, everybody kind of snap out of it and, you know, kind of look up here at, at, at what I'm about to say. Well, that's exactly, that's exactly what this author is saying here in this in this word it's a word where he's getting their attention beware look out for something that's very prevalent here something that can take place most of the translations use either the word exhort or encourage but the amplified i think really gives uh the best meaning i mean it's really not a, a, a translation it's kind of a what would you call it? it it's an it's a explanation, maybe, it'd be the way to say it. But it says to warn, to admonish. That means to warn, to urge, and to encourage. And those words represent the full meaning of the word. 
And so it also says that this is something that we're to do daily. In fact, one of the translations there, the ESV, uh, says, but exhort one another every day. Every day. You need to be exhorting people. You need to be encouraging people. You need to be building people up. I have a, one of the brothers in my church, and he calls me almost every day. He calls me all the time. And, and generally, I spend my time encouraging him uh, in, in, uh, in the things of God. And so, I guess the question is, why is all of this necessary? I mean, why are believers commanded to be warning and admonishing each other so often? And I think that's the important question to answer. Now, once again, once again, I'm trying to help you to figure out how you're going to approach a passage. And you have to ask the questions. You have to ask the right questions. So when you come to something like this, you've got to ask, well, why does God want me to do this? Why is God asking the readers to do this? And it's simply because it's quite possible, very, very possible, that through personal ne neglect, through some level of spiritual indifference, how many people do you know in your church that exercise personal neglect in the things of God? I mean, how many people do you know that are personally right now today neglecting the things of God. Let's say you have children in your home. Okay, I have uh, I have six grandkids, and I would say that uh, five of them are excellent students. They make gr good grades. They make A's, B's. They're on honor roll. They're in they're in uh, uh, college level courses. Uh, my older uh, granddaughters are. Uh, but one of my grandchildren, he just, he's not doing well. You know, because when he gets home, all he wants to do is play. He wants to go ride his four-wheeler. He wants to get on one of his video games. He wants, to, he wants to go play basketball. He wants to do anything that he can do rather than study. And, and he's the one that makes the bad grades. He's the one that gets a bad report back, gets comments from the teachers, didn't do this, didn't do that. It's just personal neglect. Well, that happens all the time in the spiritual realm. We're just being naive if we think that everybody is mature and growing and everybody is really walking with God and giving priority to the things of God that they should. That's just, that, that would be ludicrous on my part to even think that. And it's because of that condition that exists, not, not with lost people, it's because of that condition that exists with saved people that it's my, it's my job, it's your job, it's our job, to warn, to exhort, to encourage, to admonish, to build up, to, to tell people to beware that you have much to lose if, if, you don't, if you don't do these things. And he says here that the problem is, is that if, if we don't do that, their hearts are going to be hardened. Their hearts are going to become hard to the things of God. This is not something that happens overnight. It's not something that happens quickly. I've got to make a, a we, my, uh, we own a, uh, an in-ground pool, and uh, in the, this weekend, I've got to go at the skimmer, it, it's uh, the plastic part of the skimmer, for whatever reason, has broken, it's got a little crack in it, and I'm sure that water's getting down into the wall behind it. And so I bought some epoxy, um, and I gotta go, and I gotta take that epoxy, and I gotta take the two parts, and I gotta roll it together. It's waterproof, and I can put it down there and kind of smooth it out, and it will become, it will come become very, very hard. And I, I just gotta go do that, and it does it quickly. I mean, it probably, I probably by the time I start rolling the thing and getting it together, I probably have 20 minutes max to get that thing in the water, to get it down there, to, to you know, to move it around. To, to get it in the right place, to get it smoothed out, to do everything I got to do. I probably got 20 minutes, maybe 30 at the most. It's going to harden very quickly. We're not talking about that. We're not, we're, not, we're not talking about something happens after a service one Sunday. This hardening process is something that takes place over an extended period of time. It's like children, right? We call them, they're like wet cement. You know, they just get harder and harder and harder and harder. I have a, 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 a man in my church who is a, he's a police officer and he's, he started about going to teach school and he said, I like to teach the fifth to the eighth grade. 
He said, if you don't get them by the eighth grade, you lose them. They're gone. I mean, they're just gone. They're, they just, they've already been culturalized, if you would. Uh, whether or not that's true, I, I don't know. But what I do know is that it doesn't take much to lose your children. You know, they can become hard. They become hard to the things of God. But it doesn't happen overnight. And it doesn't happen overnight in the lives of the people that he's talking about here. And that's why this constant encouragement is needed. Just constant encouragement to people. You know, I'm all the time, just all the time, every week, in some way or another, I am talking to my people about being fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. I said, listen, we call ourselves Christians, but that term is really not even used in the Bible, but twice. It's only used two times, if uh, maybe three at the most. I forget. It may be based on what, what, in, you know, what uh, uh, translation that you have. And, and normally, the real word for uh, a, a Christian in, in the New Testament was that they were followers. He calls them brethren here a lot in this book. They were followers of Christ, or they were disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want my people to understand, I, I want them to sense that what you can't be a follower of Christ if you're not following Christ, right? I mean, how much sense does that make? That, well, I'm a follower of Christ, but I'm not following Christ. If you're going to be a follower of Christ, you've got to follow the person of Jesus Christ. And so we just got to be constantly uh, encouraging them to combat that propensity that every believer potentially has of departing from, of abandoning uh, the things of God in their life for what the world offers and the writer simply says that sin is deceitful. It deceives. It lies. It tells. It never tells. Sin never tells you the truth about what it's going. What its impact is going to be in your life. So one of the practical cures given to the church for helping those who struggle with unbelief, and eventually who may depart from the living God, um, is just constant encouragement from those. Those who are committed believers. Listen, you can't be an encouragement to somebody if your life is not committed to Christ. Just don't even try. Don't even go there. If you're not following Christ, if you're not, if, 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 if you're not spending time in God's Word, if, if it's just this kind of a, uh, just a haphazard, lackadaisical kind of approach to the Christian life, just forget it. Just forget it. Just, don't, just ignore these verses here. Because you're the person that needs the encouragement. Not them. You can't encourage somebody in an area in which I can encourage my people. I can encourage them that every day of their life, they need to have a private, personal time with Jesus Christ. A meaningful time. I told them several weeks ago, I said, I said, and we were talking about, I was encouraging all of them to have a, have a journal. I, I do this all the time. Have a notebook. Write down everything. If you have trouble staying away in church, just get you a pen and paper and write it down. Just keep writing down. I have one lady, she's just writing the whole time. I mean, she's not writing because she's trying to stay awake. She's just writing the whole time. She, she's just, and I send her my messages. I, I send all the messages to her. Uh, she's on the mailing list. She gets the audios. Her husband listens, uh, he's there, and he listens to the audios on his way to work. His work is about an hour and ten minutes away. And so he's, he listens to the audios every week. Uh, even, I mean, listens to them again. I have a lady that takes all of the messages in the church and she takes the notes that I send to her and she uses those to teach her children in the morning. And they go over the message and make sure that they kind of understand it. There'll be plenty of times she'll come and she'll ask me a question about, did I get this right? Did I understand this properly? You know, just take the notes. Just do what you have to do to pay attention to what God is saying to you. And the one comment that I made to my people, I said, listen, listen, uh, if, if when you have your devotion in the morning, if you just get up and you rush through it and uh, you get, you're in a hurry already, you got all these things on your mind, uh, just wait and do it at night. But let's just say that you, you are having your personal time with God and it's not meaningful to you. I mean, it's just, you're rushing through it, you just, it's just kind of rote now, you're just trying to, you're just trying to get through it quickly, you know, you're just trying to, to, uh, uh, you got other things to do, you got other things on your mind. If it's not meaningful to you, do you think it's meaningful to God? 
do you think that God is enjoying what you're doing? Have you ever been talking to somebody and they weren't listening to you? You know? I mean, you knew that they weren't listening to you? If God's talking to you in His Word and you're not listening to Him, I mean, do you enjoy that? I mean, you're kind of looking at them, you know, and they're looking around all over the place. And I mean, do you want to talk to somebody like that? I wouldn't. Why would God want to open up His Word to you and open up your heart to those kind of things if, 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 if it's not important to you, if it's not meaningful to you, you can be assured it's certainly not meaningful to Him. And so this is, this is who this writer is talking to. This is who he wants to warn. And every believer, I think, needs to develop this skill and follow through with this injunction. But you've got to be, you've got to have a basis, you've got to have a foundation for even being able to, to exhort someone. I mean, you can't exhort someone in something that's not actually taking place in your life. In Hebrews 3, there are five specific exaltations of the person of Christ. The exaltations uh, are the very heart of the entire epistle. Philippians chapter 2 uh, verse 9 through 11 explained to us why when it says, Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, when we confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and when we exalt Him as Lord of our life, what we are doing is that we are affirming His sovereignty over our life. We are affirming His authority as our Lord over our life. We are affirming those things to other people. We are telling other people that we believe that Jesus Christ has the right and the authority and the sovereignty to rule over our life. It is when these issues are not fully understood and when Christians just kind of casually abort these areas, you know, the sovereignty of God, the Lordship of Christ. There's such a debate over the Lordship of Christ. It, it just, I'm staggered. I am just staggered that there's even a debate about it. A lot of the debate started... Uh, uh, between uh, John MacArthur, that's why he wrote the, the book that he did. It was called the uh, um, what was the book that he wrote? The Gospel According. Yeah, to the, Jesus. the Gospel According to Jesus, because of this kind of ongoing debate that he was having with some of the professors at Dallas Theological Seminary, and the, and the, this this whole debate just I mean it just went. You know, I was stunned at the fact that men were even arguing. Uh, maybe arguing is not the right word, that they were having to have a debate as to whether or not Jesus Christ is Lord of somebody's life. I mean, it just doesn't even make sense to me. And so, if these issues aren't understood, then and, and Christians just kind of abort these fundamental truths out of their life through just spiritual neglect, the heart becomes hard, then the warnings and the exhortations and the encouragements, they become a necessary part of their life. I mean, that's how you have to deal with them. Uh, to not follow Christ, to not be willing to commit your life to Christ, is demeaning. It's demeaning to the work of God in you. It's demeaning to the salvation that God has given to you. It's demeaning to the tremendous sacrifice that Jesus Christ has made on your part. It's irreverent, and it's absolutely flippant for us to call ourselves followers of Christ and not to follow Christ. That doesn't even, even make sense to me. To say, well, I'm a, I'm a fully devoted follower of Christ, but I'm not willing to follow Christ. And yet I think by their lives that that's exactly how many Christians live. They just haven't settled the issue yet. For some reason... They've got their ticket to heaven, and so they're a little bit more casual about all of these things. Because I have my ticket to heaven, just because that I have that, 
I can't be irreverent. I can't just be casual. I can't be flippant. I can't be different about what it means to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. So all of these exaltations are given to help us to refocus our attention on what's really and eternally important. And that is that of becoming a fully devoted follower, follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we find here uh, that he's called the apostle and high priest of our confession, and that's specifically dealing with his high priestly work. In fact, I didn't mention this earlier, but he is uh, in chapter 2, uh, verse 17, is the first place that he's actually called our high priest, and then in chapter 3, verse 1, he's called our high priest again. And so he has this high priestly work on our behalf, and it's something that we're going to find a little bit later that is forever. It's not just for a month or just while we're saved here on the earth, on this planet. It's, it's an, it's a, he's going to be our high priest in the eternal state. In verse 2, it says he was faithful to him who appointed him. Remember, we talked about how the context of this is being faithful, right? It's not salvation. We're not talking about salvation. Obviously, being faithful is a part of salvation. But he's talking about uh, the faithfulness of Christ and the faithfulness of Moses. It says in verse 3, he's been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. In verse uh, 3, he's the one who has built the house. This is his house. This is his creation. The church is his institution. Uh, you know, the church is, uh, we're the bride of Christ. He, he's the one that has built the house. And once again, in verse 6, it's implied that he was faithful. In fact, if you go to the NSAB, the uh, NIV, the ESV, the RSV, and the Amplified versions, they all utilize the actual word faithful in their translation of verse 6. So we're talking about faithfulness. Faithfulness. And so we have this picture here of Jesus Christ uh, and his exaltation in those first six verses. Next, in Hebrews 3, it gives several characteristics that can describe a believer. Uh, only one, actually, you might consider it two, because I've got verse 6 and verse 14, but I think they're saying the same thing. Just uh, They're talking about the same characteristic, and then that four of them are negative. So you've got one that's positive, and you've got four that are negative. And that simple fact alone... Just that very simple fact alone should clarify that the disciplines of the Christian life and the exhortations of Scripture are not something that you and I can just casually ignore. Every admonition of Scripture, every warning, every exhortation has immense significance for the believer. They're the words that have the uh, life-transforming effects in the believer's life when they're given their attention. When I obey these things, that's when God works in my life. In verse 6 and verse 14, it says here that a, a believer is somebody that can hold fast. In verse 6, whose house we are if we hold fast. You could say because we hold fast. In verse 14, we become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast. To the end, because we're holding it, that you ought to be doing that. You ought to be able to look me right straight in the eye and say, "I'm I'm holding fast to my confidence. I'm not I'm not wavering. I'm not wandering around in the wilderness out there." And so, uh, it's a it, it's a it, it's a great encouragement here. I, I mean, it ought to be a profound encouragement to you, being faithful to the things of God. It's a great privilege. You know, I, I hope, I hope, I don't know. I don't know how to compare myself with somebody else, and the Bible says it's not good to compare ourselves with other people. I know that there are Christians out there that are amazing. There are Christians today, as we speak, that are being, having their children beheaded, that they're being killed, um, murdered for their faith. Uh, wow, I mean, we're, we're talking about things that we've never even experienced. And I don't know how God measures faithfulness, but I hope that when I stand before God, that He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. I don't want it to be any less. 
I don't want him to say, well, Gary, there were a lot of things in your life that you didn't let me deal with, you know. You might have thought that you were, that, that you were proper in this area, but I'm sorry, son. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. And I believe that me and you and anybody else that's in a position like we are, that we can be faithful to the things of God. And, you know, I can hold fast to my confidence. I can be faithful in studying the Word of God. I can be faithful in teaching the Word of God. I can be faithful in evangelizing the lost. I can be faithful in training people in the things of God. I can be faithful in discipling people in the things of God. And so can you. So can you, right? Verse 8, verse 13, and verse 15 says that believers can harden their hearts to the things of God. We've talked about this a good bit. This aspect of hardening the heart is further stated in uh, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 7, where he says, once again, repeats that phrase in the Old Testament there. So in 19 verses, the author gives four repeated admonitions for believers not to harden their hearts. Well, why do you think he would do that? He's not talking to unbelievers here. The Holy Spirit's talking to believers. You know, he's talking to believers about not hardening their hearts. The reason he's saying those words is because that's exactly what can happen. Spiritual neglect, you know, personal negligence, lack of faithfulness in, uh, in the things of God, and they become spiritually stubborn and obstinate and ultimately indifferent to God's word in their life. God says, don't harden your heart, brother. Sister, don't harden your heart. Don't, don't harden your heart to the things of God. Keep it open. Keep it tender. Keep asking God, Lord, what is it that I'm, that I'm stubborn in? Where, where, what, where is it that I'm obstinate? What is it in my life that I'm not listening to you? What is it that I have a tendency to do what I want to do? rather than what you want me to do. Lord, what is it in my life that's keeping me from being useful in your kingdom? That's what we're talking about here. We're talking about brethren. We're talking about holy brethren, partakers of the divine nature. And so, once again, you know, you have to ask the question, well, why would the author even, even mention that four times in those 19 verses? I don't think that he would mention it four times if there wasn't a potential for it happening in somebody's life, right? I mean, that's only that's only that only makes sense. I, I, I don't even well, I, I don't want to use the word logical. It just doesn't make any sense to see it any other way. And so the the repeated nature of the warning magnifies the reality of its probability. You know, if he'd only said it once, said it in some kind of obscure passage, I think that would have been different. We have a whole chapter. We have 19 verses here. And that's, that's the primary context of what he's talking about. So he's saying that there is a high probability. There's a very high probability that the believer is going to harden their heart because they're not paying attention. And I think there's some severe consequences. It's not something that you and I can take lightly. In verse 12, he says that believers can have an evil heart of unbelief, and because of that, that they may eventually depart from the living God. I don't think I can tell you exactly what that means. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I can just tell you by doing a word study on, on what it really means to depart from the living God. I, I, I just, uh, I know, I've known over uh, my years as a Christian, I've known so many people, unfortunately, go to all kinds of churches. And, uh, and, uh, and it doesn't appear to me that they've grown in 30 years. It just doesn't appear to me that they've made any progress in their Christian life. In fact, some of them, they just become more stubborn. You know, they become more hardened. They're more difficult to get along with. I've seen a lot of that in deacons. We, we have deacons in our church, but we primarily, our leadership uh, model is elders, which I think is what it ought to be out of 1 Timothy 3 and Titus. Uh, but uh, 
But I've seen deacons that were so hard, almost cruel. You know, they thought they were, you know, they, they, they're going to lead the church. And rather than growing in the things of Christ and demonstrating humility and, and a preference and having a servant's heart, uh, it's just not there. It's just not there. They want to they wanna run everything. They want to control everything. You know, I had a pastor that went for an interview at a church. This is several years ago. And uh, he, he came back. He just was laughing. Uh, these people had called him in for an interview. And they told him, he said, we're the deacons and we run the church. And uh, uh, all we want you to do is to preach for us on Sunday morning. We'll take care of everything else. And uh, I just laughed. I, I just laughed. It's not their church. They're not the head of the church. Christ is the living head of, of his church. And you would think that people would just grow. But I, I find that there are a lot of people whose hearts have, have really become hard over an extended period of time. You want to know why? Do you want to know why? It's, it's because they have neglected. They've neglected. That there's a personal neg negligence. They're not in the Word. They're not seeking God's will for their life. They're, they're just, they just have these ideas about the church and about what it means to be a Christian. And, and, but they never, they never take this and they never, they never let this really get applied into their heart. They don't take it seriously. They're just forgetful hearers of the Word and not doers of it. They just look into a mirror and examine themselves and then they go their way and just forgot everything that's been said. They're negligent. In verse 18, it says here that believers can be disobedient. Just disobedient. It's a sign of disrespect and a lack of reverence for that which is sacred. I think it's the earmark of spiritual immaturity. We're going to talk about it at great length uh, beginning in chapter 5, verse 12, all the way through verse 8. And so we'll, I'll uh, wait until we get there. Verse 19, uh, believers can fail to enter into God's rest. Why? Because they're just not willing to believe God. They're just not willing to trust God in an area of their life. I'm not talking about jumping off a cliff in blind faith and closing your eyes. And We're not talking about that at all. We're just saying, talking about when you get to something and God talks to you and God communicates to you, just go do what God says. Just do it. Just go do what God says for you to do. If he tells you to be tender-hearted and kind and forgiving, just go do that. That's where the blessing of God is. It's when you learn that all God wants you to do is to be obedient with the right attitude to his word. Just go do it. And that's what God will bless in your life. It says uh, in verse Hebrews 11:6, without faith it's impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Who does he reward? Those who diligently seek him. Diligently. That's got to be the key word in that whole passage. Diligently. In Hebrews 3, there are two major exhortations. So we only got two major exhortations in this chapter. And both of them relate to the same subject in verse 6 and 14 these two encouragements to every believer are to every believer to hold fast to what they know to be true now i want you to, i want to say something here and i'll go over it when we get to the end of this chapter with the handout here which is just in a page or so everything that i'm saying to you Every, I'm not, this is not deep here believers can fail to enter in god's rest you know there are two major exhortations uh, uh, all of this no, none of this comes out of a commentary none of that, there's not any of it comes out of commentary let me, let me go look here at the end of this I think we've already looked at it everything that I've shared with you there's three areas where I have yep, uh, I have kind of nine notes and they're all about the word word studies no commentaries this is just me sitting down reading these verses See, well, how many exhortations do we have? Well, this is an exhortation in verse 6. This is ex exhortation in verse 14. And I, that's all I'm sharing with you. Do, it, do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not, I'm not reading words out of a commentary. I'm not just taking a commentary, taking those. I'm just letting God's Word say what it says. The power of God is resident in the Word of God. Especially as you take it accurately don't overdo it. You don't have to embellish any of this. You don't have to add a lot to it. 
You just let it say what it says. Just let God speak. This is His Word. He, he can get it into somebody's heart. It can say what He wants it to say to them any way that He wants to. And so we have these two encouragements uh, to hold fast to what they know to be true. And so when a person becomes a believer, one of the things that God does is that He gives them a new heart and He guides them into the truth. John chapter 16, verse 13 says, However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. And so, in essence, the writer is encouraging these believers to hold fast to their conf confidence because he understands that there is this subtle pro propensity, this inclination, if you would, that exists in every believer to kind of loosen their grip on things that they need to be on the deeper things of the Christian life. And uh, so excellence in the Christian life is something that must be both intentional and deliberate. Now this is a, this for me, for me personally, what I'm talking about here and what we're going to begin to talk about is something that has tremendous significance for me personally. It ought to have tremendous significance for you personally. Excellence. You know, I am just stunned at times at some of the papers that students have handed in over the, over the years. I love my students in Romania. I'm not saying I don't love my students in America. That's not the case. But they are so diligent to hand their work in on time and for it to be excellent work. All of the students that we have were A or B students. I mean, and an A is 96 to 100. You know, it's not 91 to 100. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a small range. But they're all good students. I have two students that are deaf. They're deaf. They can't hear a word. They can't even talk. They cannot even, I mean, they, they can mumble. They can make noises. And so what they're doing is that they're watching somebody take notes while the teacher is teaching and they're writing those notes down. They're, they're, they're constantly looking over somebody's shoulder and writing down what that person says. And then they make charts. And they, their intent for being at Covington is that they want to start a school, a Christian school, for the deaf and mute. <laughs> How about that? And they can't even talk. They do a little bit of sign language here and there, and even that's not real good. And uh, I can tell, you know, we do. I do all this all, to them all the time. That means I love you. This international sign language for I love you. And they're great. They're just, they're such a joy for me to be around. And they'll bring their charts. They'll make charts, you know, big old kind of charts. And they'll have pictures and words on it and charts and stuff. And they'll bring it and show it to us in class. Uh, they're in the bachelor level class, and I teach at the master, but they still show, they, they always want me to see it when I'm there. And so, and so they, I, I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just great. You know, for this, for somebody that, that, that can't even talk or, or, or write, I mean, read, I mean, uh, speak, uh, they, they do excellent work. Listen, if there's any place that there ought to be excellence, it's in the ministry. If you're not willing to be excellent in the work of the ministry, if you're not willing to be excellent, make an excellent effort in, in the papers that you hand in, if you just read through something kind of quickly and half skip over it and then put it at the end of the semester that, 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 that you actually read that, that book, you're a liar. You're being un untruthful. You're not being transparent. You're being dishonest. There's no room for that. There's no place for that in the ministry. There's no place for mediocrity in the ministry. This is the highest calling on the planet. Nobody else, nobody, there's no higher calling in all of life than, than the call that God has on our life uh, to, uh, to be excellent in the ministry. And I have to say to you that excellence in the ministry is both intentional and deliberate. It's intentional. You have to know that that's what you're after. 
It has to be deliberate. You have to be disciplined. I know so many pastors that are so undisciplined. It's amazing. Uh, William and I were talking recently about a pastor of a large church in our, in our city. He's not there anymore. And he'd get to church about 10 o'clock in the morning, lock his door, uh, uh, just go in there. You wouldn't know what he was doing. And, and he'd leave about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I mean, I, you know, it's like, I mean, I mean, people couldn't even talk to him. You know, I, 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 excellence in the minute is it's not an option. It's not something that you and I can can just dis, you know. Well, this week, you know, I, I was not have much time this week. Yeah, I, I shared with you in our last session. I, I I never I never stand up unprepared ever. I'll say it again. I never stand up unprepared. Doesn't matter where I am. Doesn't matter where I'm teaching. Doesn't matter, you know, if it's a big group or a small group, if it's a video, if it's at my church, if it was in a Sunday school class, if I'm teaching at Awana, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. I, I'm never unprepared. I'm, I'm always prepared. I don't say that arrogantly. I, I don't say that arrogantly. I don't mean that arrogantly. It's just the way it ought to be in every minister's life. You ought to be able to say that to anybody. You know, if, uh, if a young pastor wanted to know what to do, you ought to be able to say, well, follow me. Just watch me. I'll show you what to do. You know, I was, I was sharing my church the other day. I said, if, you know, if, if uh, somebody came and said, well, well I, I don't really know what it means to be a Christian. I, 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 thought I, I thought I could honestly, sincerely, transparently say to that person, well, just watch me. Just watch what I do. Just follow me around for for a while and I'll show you what it really means to be a Christian you know you ought to be able to do that Paul said follow me we're models if you're going to be a pastor if you're going to be in the ministry you're a model somebody ought to be able to look at you and say you know somebody some member of your church somebody comes and asks a member of your church uh, you know what does it really mean to be a Christian he said well just look at my pastor just just look at how he lives look at his life he's generous he's sacrificial He's intentional. He's deliberate. He loves the Lord. He studies. He, he's a prayer warrior. He's evangelizing. He's training. He's discipling. He guards his speech. He's not arrogant. You know, you ought to be able to say all of those things about your life if you're going to be in the ministry. If you're not, just get out. Just find something else to do. Go get another job. Because God doesn't have... I don't, I don't think there's any room for... Uh, 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 for just spiritual indifference and lethargy and mediocrity maybe is the right word in the ministry. Without an intentional spiritual focus, you'll never make any significant impact. You, you'll never make any significant spiritual progress and you'll never make any spiritual impact in your life. You'll just live out your life. You'll be a Christian 40, 50 years and just never make an impact. I know Christians that have been Christians for 50 years. They've never won one single person to Christ. They've never won one single person to Christ. I'm not even sure some of them have ever even talked to somebody about Christ. And if they did, it was kind of superficial. That's not right. That's not right. It doesn't matter what we say. That's not right. That's not how God has designed the Christian life. For Every believer, they should intentionally and purposely embrace a deliberate effort in evangelizing, training, discipling other people in their church. You now, whenever I have something to do, I, we have a, a, a new believers class for new believers. We don't have many new believers, unfortunately. But I gave, uh, I gave uh, one of the uh, uh, deacons in our church, I said, I want you to write a, a, a program. Uh, 10, 12, 16 week program for a new believer and I want you to teach it when they come and we're going to put them in this room over here if it's just one person for 16 weeks anybody can come in at any time let's say three more people got saved they could come into your class halfway through and pick up and you just keep going until you had taught all of them those 10, 12, 16 different areas. I gave him a little handout, a little outline of what I thought he could do. And next thing I know, it was probably a month and a half later, he came back with a notebook that was about that thick of a course that he had designed for 
a new believer. And uh, he keeps it and, and uh, just, you know, whenever he has that opportunity, he, use, he, he utilizes it. And uh, it's got to be intentional. Listen, this, what we're talking about is not something that just happens. We're not talking about something that just kind of happens one day. It doesn't. It's something that you have to be intentional and deliberate about. 1 Corinthians 9, 27, Paul said, But I discipline my body. I discipline my body. It's how I spend my time. It's where I spend my time. It's when I get up in the morning, when I go to bed at night. I went to bed fairly early last night, and I got up very early this morning. I got up very, very early this morning. I had a lot to do, and I went to bed early so I could get up early. I'm, I'm refreshed in the morning, took a shower, did what I had to do so I could be ready. And so for all the things that I had to do today, said, so I discipline my body. I bring it into subjection. Lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Here's the godliest man on the planet. And he recognizes that he has to live a deliberate, intentional, calculated, and, and purposeful life in order for it to really count. That's a lot of the problem with uh, many professing Christians. And I would say many many ministers of the gospel, people that are in different ministries, there's just not much intentional about their Christian life. It's just not much intentional about it. They're not very deliberate. It's kind of casual. They just take it or leave it. They study when they have to. They wait to the last minute, all that kind of stuff. They've not yet really decided that they are going to invest their lives into the kingdom of God for the glory of God. You believe, a believer cannot grow by doing nothing. Doesn't that make sense? You can't grow by doing nothing. You have to do something. There has to be an intentional effort on every believer's part for meaningful biblical growth to actually occur. You know, here's the problem that we have is that unfortunately people are not into, commem into commitments and especially commitments that require what I would consider to be a high level of sacrifice. It's much too dem demanding. We know that just from the way people treat marriage, right? I got all kinds of people that are, you know, they, you know, they have a ceremony, but they, but there's never a commitment. You know, whenever I do a wedding ceremony and and uh, for a young couple, I always, I always say, this is, this is, this is not a ceremony. What we're doing today is much, much more than just a ceremony. It's a commitment. You're making a commitment. You're making a commitment to one another. You're making a commitment to your extended family. You're making a commitment to God Almighty in heaven. You're making a vow. You are taking oaths. You know, it would do you well to go through the scriptures and see what God has to say about making an oath. He says, if you're going to make an oath to me and you're not willing to keep it, don't make it. And we have all kinds of people that are making oaths to God, pledging their life, pledging their commitment, their allegiance to one another. Two years later, they're divorced. Can't get along. There are a lot of Christians that just think this, all this is way too demanding and they're just going through the motions without really investing themselves intentionally in what God desires for their life. Too often Christians use the excuse that they do not know what God's will is for their life. Well, sure they do. The issue is never the fact that we don't know what God's will is for our life. The issue is that we're not willing to do what God's will is for our life. That's the issue. I mean, finding the will of God is never the primary issue. Listen, uh, I mean, we're, we're just... It, it's, it's God's will for my life that I be faithful. It's God's will for my life that I exhort one another daily. It's God's will that I hold my confidence steadfast to the end. That's God's will. I don't have to debate that. I don't have to, I don't have to struggle to find out what's the will of God for my life. I know it's the will of God for my wife, uh, for my life that I'm to love my wife like Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. That's God's will for my life. It's non-debatable. It's non-negotiable. It's non-optional. And so, well, what if we get to heaven 
And we find that the real issue was not finding the will of God. The real issue was not following the will of God. Listen, if you'll just follow the will, if you'll just do what you know God wants you to do, you'll know the will of God. You'll know what the will of God is if you'll be obedient. He'll lead you into it. He will make it clear to you. There are a lot of things the Bible doesn't talk about. doesn't talk about, well, should I get this job or that job or should I live in this city or that city or how many kids should I have, any of that. There, there's no place going to say we've got to have eight kids. You know? Uh, it, it's just the will of God is something, the, the specifics for your life or, or things that God will unfold for you as you put your faith and your trust in Him. He's not going to write it in a manual and give you everything that you need to know prior to the exor- uh, Him revealing His will to you. you got to walk by faith. You have to walk by faith. You have to just be listening and hearing what it is that God has to say. I don't think that the Scriptures are vague. I don't think that they're nebulous. I don't think that they're unclear. I don't think they're kind of cloudy and you can't really understand what they say. Obviously, there are some portions of Scripture that may be a little bit more difficult than other parts. We're going to get the Melchizedek, and you're going to go, huh? You know? Uh, you're going to have some of these warnings when we get to chapter 6, and you're going to go, wow! You know, this is difficult. This is hard. It's not. It's not. you just got to take it carefully. Take your time. Work through it. You'll find out the meaning that God's not trying to hide His will from anybody. Why would God want to hide and disguise what Romans chapter 12 calls that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Why would God want to keep His will from your life? Why would He want to take the most glorious path that you could ever pursue and then hide it from you? God's not playing hide and seek with His will. The one thing He wants to do more than anything else is to reveal His will. And then once He reveals it, He wants us to obey it. But I would say this, I'm not sure He's going to reveal it to you if He knows that you're not willing to obey it. And if He does reveal it to you, then you you can be assured that you have responsibility and obligations to be obedient to it. So you better be careful with the attitude that you come before God. Next, there are six verses out of the 19 that are Old Testament quotations. That's almost the third Two of them are repeated, which I think gives them added weight and significance, and it's repeated again there in chapter 4, verse 7. Uh, Once again, and he does it all the way through Hebrews, he's using the Old Testament scriptures to reinforce the basic premise uh, dealing with the believer's faithfulness and steadfastness in the Christian life. So, what are some of the truths that we've learned here in Hebrews 3? Well, we know that God wants us to be faithful and steadfast, right? That's obvious. Just like Christ, just like Moses, we, we, He doesn't want us to depart from the living God. And if we choose not to be faithful, then our hearts will become hard through unbelief and we will not experience the very important element of God's rest in our lives. He wants us to be faithful and steadfast so that we can enter into his rest. Those that aren't faithful and those that aren't steadfast in their Christian life, they'll never enter into God's rest. They'll never have peace about stuff. They'll not have the grace of God just working abundantly in their life. Uh, Not at all. One of the greatest tragedies of the Christian life is for a believer to fall significantly short of God's intended purpose for their life. You know, the older that I become as a Christian, uh, the, the, it's, it's like the more that I'm doing. You know, the, I just, it's like, it's like, it's like my, my life is so full of things that God wants me to do. Just think about my schedule here. I just got back from Romania. Uh, I just got back from Romania at the, um, in the middle of uh, September, in November, first uh, at the end of October, uh, I'll be going uh, to, Z- to Zimbabwe, to Romania. In February, I'll be going to the Philippines and to Indonesia. In March, I'll be going back to Romania. In, in uh, uh, May, I will be going to Romania again. You know, it's, it's, uh, i got a church that I'm pastoring. I'm uh, developing uh, online courses. 
I'm doing uh, uh, study questionnaires for uh, some of the distance learning classes that we're changing. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a father. I'm a husband. Uh, I'm a friend. Uh, I have all kinds of things going on in my life. I love it. This is great stuff. It just doesn't get any better than this, being busy. You know, some guys, all they want to do is just sit in their little kind of ivory tower, open their books, do all their studying, and they never get out and, and let God use them in other venues. You know? I, I'm not saying that if you're a pastor, you ought to be leaving your church every week. That's not the case at all. My church is very good to me. We have plenty of men in my church that, that can teach when I'm gone. I love that. That's great. I don't even have to, I don't ever worry about any of that. Uh, none of them teach as long as I do. You know, they're going to, if I don't let my people out to 1 or one fifteen, they might let them out at 12.15 or 12.30. But, um, you know, this is in, in, intentional. There are a lot of Christians that live what I call accidentally. They just live accidentally. In other words, if God uses them in a meaningful way, very often it's more accidental than intentional. It wasn't intentional on their part. Just happened to be in the right place at the right time. But I believe that the people that God is divinely using are those people who are intentionally, willingly, and deliberately living for His glory. I'm, Lord, this is what I want to do. I want to go beyond where I am. I want to be intentionally involved in other things. I want my life to count. I want it to count today, next week, next month, next year. I want to be making an impact in more than just one place. You've given me everything that I need for life and godliness. We can do this. And for those of us who are pastors, every message has to be intentional. Every message has to be intentional. We have to make sure that the gospel is never diluted, that the message is clear, that it's understandable, and when we embrace the message of Hebrews, we must consistently emphasize that there is much to lose in not embracing the Christian life and the message here in Hebrews. In John chapter, in Second John chapter, uh, in Second John eight, John said, "Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we work for." <laughs> How important is that? Look to yourselves. Young man in the ministry, young man going into the ministry, young lady, look to yourself that you don't lose the things that you're working for. I've had a, a lot more students drop out of school than have stayed in school. I never understand that. I never get that. I, I don't understand that at all. It's not our responsibility, I think, to define the terms of discipleship because Christ already done that for us. Our, our responsibility is just to deliberately and intentionally be committed to completing what God has given us to do. And as long as He hasn't returned, it means that there's still work to do. Therefore, brethren, hold fast to your confidence. Hold it fast to the end and exhort one another daily while it is still called today. All right. I want you to turn the page over and I want you to look there on page 12. This is, uh, I've given you this as just as an example. The reason I've given you chapter 9, and I'll give, I might give it to you again in the next course, is because for me this is probably the most important chapter in all of, maybe in all the Word of God. Uh, uh, if you're not familiar with Hebrews and what it's like, then you, you may not understand that. I think he, uh, Romans 8 would be one of those passages. There's certainly others. If you're dealing with certain, certain themes, say if you were dealing with the sovereignty of God, you would certainly think that Romans chapter 9, 10, 11 would be uh, that, those passages. But uh, this is just uh, the key elements. I want to go through it just a little bit just to show you what I do. Uh, this is typical for each chapter, and I want you to keep in mind that the content of each part is subjective. It's relative to what I'm doing personally. It's, it's relative to whether or not I'm listening to the Lord. If, if you did the same thing, hopefully, hopefully, 
if you took every one of these key verbs, infinitive phrase, keywords, whatever it is, that we wouldn't be too far off from one another. Because we're reading the same thing. We're reading the same, uh, the same number of verses here. And uh, so, uh, there, and, I, and, I, and I want to say it's subjective. It's relative to what you think is important. There's no right, there's no wrong. There, there's no place in the Bible that said, well, they, that, brother, that was right, or that was wrong. Um, but you'll find it, I think if, if you'll do this, you can preach out of this. This is all you need. I mean, this is, this is all that you really need. You may need a little technical help, word studies, all that kind of stuff. How many pages I got here? I got five, five pages of this. Big print probably, but um, sometimes I put them on both sides of the page. You know? But I think... Uh, if, if you'll perform this exercise for each chapter, the major elements will reveal to you a great deal of information before you ever open up a commentary. But I would encourage you, don't open up your commentaries until you're through studying and, and writing your message. And then you can go back and add to and kind of, kind of embellish some things that you've said, maybe say it in a, in a little different way. That's perfectly fine. But I want to go over these key elements here in Hebrews 9 with you. I'm not going to look at everything, so don't. Uh, but I want you to, if you would, to turn to Hebrews chapter 12, I mean Hebrews chapter 9 for just a minute uh, with me. I've defined the key verbs. You'll see I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and there's some words that they're the same word, but they're in the past tense or the present tense. And you can see, let's take... Let's take verse uh, the first one there, entered or enters. And I've asked the question, why was it necessary to enter the most holy place? I've got to ask the questions. If I don't, I, I'll miss the point. Uh, obtained in verse 12, that he has obtained eternal redemption. Well, how did he do that? How did Christ, you know, well, that's easy to understand. Well, maybe it's not. Maybe it's something that the author really wants you to understand here. That's why he's giving you that word. How did Christ offer himself? Uh, what's the purpose of the sprinkling? You know, they go in there and they just sprinkle the blood on these instruments in the earthly sanctuary. Why did Christ appear in heaven? And then you come to the infinitive phrases and... They usually begin with two. I want to show you what's important here and what the insight into this. There's one in verse 14 that talks about serving, but you'll see that there are one, two, three, there are four infinitive phrases in verse 24, 26, and 28. To appear, to suffer, to put away, and to bear. And what that tells us, an, an infinitive phrase normally tells us why. And, and a lot of times it, it just simply begins with the word to. And so he's telling us, he's given us, if I can say it this way, he's given us four whys. He's given us, he's, he's, he's consolidated all of these infinitive phrases at the end. He's put them in verse uh, 24, just in three verses right here at the very end. So he's trying to tell us some things here. You know, why is it, I think you would ask the question in verse 24, why did Christ, why has he entered, not entered the holy place made with hands, but into heaven itself? Well, why did he enter into heaven? Well, he did it to appear in the presence of God for us. Uh, uh, he, he, he would have had to suffer if he hadn't have done this. He did it to put away sin. And uh, he did it to bear the sins of many. So he's given us, there's a whole message there, just right there in those four infinitive phrases. There's some key words. Uh, I've given you a whole list of them. There's a bunch of them. Uh, I like, uh, say like the last one there, once uh, under O. It emphasizes the power of Christ's sacrifice. He, so just look at, now here's what I want you to glean from this, okay? Look at uh, number O. He uses it in verse 7, 12, 26, 27, and 28. He just keeps saying it once, 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 
He just did it once. But if you go back through and you look at you look at all the different major words, you would see that the primary word is number F. It's the word blood. It's used one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times. Ten times in twenty eight in twenty eight verses. Almost one out of every three verses. So that's the most used word in the chapter. Well, what's that telling you? It's telling you how important that word is to the concept of this chapter. We're going to see that when we get to the word rest in chapter 4. It's a critical word. It, that's, the whole chapter is about rest, or the majority of it is. And so that word represents a major emphasis of the chapter. So if you don't take the time to figure that out, if you've got a word search program or a Logos program or something that you can go, you can find out what you think is a particular word. You can just type in blood or you can type in most holy place, whatever it may be, and just say, I want you to search for that word in Hebrews chapter 9. It'll go out and, and bring up for you every place where that word is used. It'll do the work for you. We're not talking about something that's difficult. I normally do this. I normally do this without that. I, I try to do it just through my meditation in the morning. When I'm reading through the chapter, I say, all right, today I'm, I'm looking for the primary words. And it, it, makes, a, it, it makes a big difference to me. Uh, so you can see there's some words that I thought were important, say symbolic in verse 9, but it's only used once. You might not have put that down. That'd be perfectly fine. Be perfectly fine if you didn't see that as one of the critical words. We have key phrases. Why did the high priest enter into the most holy place with blood? Why did he have to go in there with blood? Um, what does when does this reformation occur? The, the time of reformation in verse in verse ten there. Uh, I mean, what is the time of reformation? You know, what's he talking about? I think the most important phrase in the entire chapter is verse 12 when it says that he went in with his own blood. Um, so you can just, you can look those, you can see how many I've got. I've got all the way down through why. Uh, every one of those are key phrases. Uh, look at verse 22 there, in O and P. Purified with blood, without shedding of blood. No remission. What's the meaning of remission? Uh, just uh, you can find that you can find that there's multiple key phrases in uh, in certain verses. Say, look back up at I. I mean J. For this reason. For what reason? I mean, if he says that there, and he says uh, in uh, verse uh, what is it? Verse 15 there. He says, and for this reason. Well, what reason? Well, it's kind of like therefore. Or he's pointing you back. You got you to pick that up. Talks about the redemption of the transgressions. Those who are called. Uh, they're the therefores. Verse 18, verse 23. There aren't any repeated phrases. There are a lot of connecting words here. I think uh, important connecting words. They're small words. Uh, I spend a lot of time with the, the small words. You can see all the exaltations of Christ. Uh, they begin in verse 11. They go through verse 28. Now, this is important. I want you to see this. There are no exhortations. And what that indicates, generally, is that it's a doctrinal section of Scripture. Okay? It's a doctrinal section of Scripture. It's, it's uh, in a different tense. Uh, there are no imperative tense verbs here. Uh, there are no reproofs. That's an indication that the entire chapter is doctrinal. If you look at verse 13, there are no warnings. I've given you some doctrines. That's just uh, the coming of Christ, the judgment, the mediatorial work of Christ. Uh, there's some promises. So we have no ex exhortations, no reproofs, and no warnings in this chapter. We don't have any historical narratives. We only have one Old Testament quotation. Uh, I've given you the context. And then uh, I've given you the major divisions. Of, of how that's broken up. Uh, I use a lot of times uh, the divisions that are already given to me in the Scriptures. You know that my Bible's already done it for me. But uh, not all the time. 
And then when you come to the key ideas and the application, that's all subjective. It's just subjective to what you think are the key ideas. I've said, say, for instance, everything taking place in the earthly sanctuary is a picture and a type of that which is taking place in the heavenly sanctuary. And you might think, well, that won't preach. Oh, yes, it will. Oh, yes, it will. It's, words, it's God's Word. You don't want to bypass things that are important. Now, Hebrews 9 is the pinnacle revelation of the high priestly ministry of Christ. It's a key idea. We finally got to the pinnacle. We've got to the top. We're at the top of the mountain here. The reader must understand the connection between the earthly sanctuary and the heavenly sanctuary in order to understand the actual atonement. What's going on in the earthly sanctuary is just a picture of what's taking place. It's just a type of what's taking place in the heavenly sanctuary. It's just pointing to something that's going to take place later. You can look under application. Well, I, I can assure you that when we get to chapter 9 in the second part of this study, that we're going to go over most of this stuff that's here on this page. And these applications, reflecting the greatness of Christ, His atoning work. How do I, how do I reflect the greatness of Christ's atoning work? How, do, how am I to offer myself to God? You know, Christ offered Himself to the Father. Well, how am I to offer myself to the Father? See, if I'll just let the Scriptures develop the content for me, I don't, I don't, have, to, I don't have to have 40 books around me to figure out what's going on. I'm just going to let the Scriptures say what the Scriptures want to say. That's all I'm going to do. That's all that you have to do. So, uh, I will go over this in more detail and just show you how we have developed it later on as we, as we go through. All right, I'd like for you to turn to Hebrews chapter 4. Show sure, another chapter. We said it over and over again. It ought not be new to us now that the key word in Hebrews 4 is the word rest. It's referred to 11 times, and it's not mentioned in the remainder of the letter after verse 11. In fact, in fact, chapter 3, uh, where does it mention the word rest? It does it in verse 18 of chapter 3. Um... Obviously, there are references to rest in, in verse 19, so we see they could not enter in to God's rest because of unbelief. You, know, you could almost say it's implied there. This is the only place in the New Testament where this word is referred to here. It's the only place. It's the only place. You, you're not going to be able to go to other places and get a lot of references about it. Somebody may give you one in, in a topical Bible or something of that nature, but this is, the, and especially... Chapter 4, verse 1 through 11 is really the only place that God talks about entering into this rest. And uh, 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 in Acts chapter 7, verse 49, it, there's a quote about it from the Old Testament, so, so that's really one other place. But this is the only place in all the New Testament where the subject of entering into God's rest is actually addressed. So this is what you would call the doc, doctrinal statement on rest. If you were teaching doctrine and you wanted to teach on the doctrine of rest, this is where you'd go. There's not any place else that you can go. The word rest is the Greek word kataposis. Uh, Pawo means to cease or desist, and kata means down and speaks of that which is permanent. So when you put the two words together, it refers to a permanent ceasing of activity or what could be called a permanent kind of rest. It's a spiritual rest. It's a spiritual rest that's only available to God's people. Dr. Ildefonso is an amazing Christian. He's one of the other online professors and he lives in Los Angeles. He has... Um, uh, he's had a, 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 a wonderful impact on my life uh, over the years. Uh, we, we travel together constantly. Uh, he travels all over the world a lot more than I do. Uh, he uh, has a school in Honduras that he's the dean of. He goes to Chile, Brazil, Pakistan, India. Uh, 
I'm leaving some places out that he goes to. And then he goes to Romania. We go to Zimbabwe together. We're going to be going to uh, the Philippines and uh, Indonesia together. Uh, he just travels all the time. He just, he's, uh, he's just, he's teaching. Uh, his church sends him out. He's sort of like a, I mean, he's the pastor of his church. He's sort of like a missionary for his church. And one of the things that I've learned uh, from Dr. Il Defonso is that he's at rest. He's never afraid. He's never afraid. I remember one time in Zimbabwe, a truckload of soldiers. It was like, it was either, it was like, I think it was eight, eight trucks that had 12 soldiers on each one of them. And they, he and Dr. Sullivan are out in the bush and these soldiers drive up and they got these, uh, you know, these AK-45s, whatever they call them, these automatic weapons. And they drop out and they're sitting there holding their weapons. And next thing you know, the guy that's the leader starts to threaten them, actually begins to threaten them. And uh, says, uh, you know, we can, uh, you know, we kill you if we want to. And uh, Eddie, Eddie says to them something like, "It's no problem, man. My insurance is paid up. My, my wife's taken care of. I'm getting older. My knees are getting apart. I'm getting you know, gray hair or losing my hair or this and that." And uh, uh, just went on one thing after another. Said, "If you got to shoot me, go ahead." <laughs> Doctor Sullivan is just kind of. Sitting there on the side, he's, he's reacting a little bit differently to all of that. I've heard him tell this story several times. He's at rest. I mean, he's at rest. I, I remember one time we were, we were over the North Atlantic in an airplane, and we hit an air pocket. Uh, if you've never done that when you're flying, and the plane just drops. I mean, it is just, it's, it's kind of frightening. I mean, it just, it's like the plane just drops out of the air, and it just falls, you know. I mean, it may be several hundred you know, at several hundred yards. I don't know how, how you know how how much it is. You're going 550 miles an hour, and the suitcases are falling out of the top. And if you if you got any food on the table or something, they all come out, and people are falling out into the aisles and stuff. And he just looked at me. And he said, "Hallelujah, see it." I mean, it was just like just relaxed, at peace. You know, I want to be like that. I, I want to be like, I don't want to be afraid. I don't want to go somewhere. Uh, Eddie go anywhere in the world. He actually, in Pakistan, he goes to, uh, when he's there, he often goes to uh, a mosque and debates with an iman. Debates with an iman. He debates with an iman in Los Angeles. And, uh, uh, I mean, those guys there, they're, they're serious about killing people. And, uh, but he's just not afraid, you know? Why? Why? Wow. It's because he's at spiritual rest. This is a this is this is a spiritual rest that only God can give to us. It's his it's his, his permanent rest. It's always available. It's always available to those who are willing to enter into it. We're not talking about heaven here. Okay, that'd be great. That'd be great. We're talking about a spiritual rest that's available to you right now. God wants you to enter into it. One very interesting point about how many of the different commentators interpret the use of the word rest in Hebrews is how they relate it back to the story in the Old Testament of Joshua. Uh, in verse 8, for instance, For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of, a, of another day. And so what they do is that they make a comparison and they say, this is what they say, they say that the earthly rest that's granted to God's people in the promised land of Canaan anticipated the heavenly rest. Okay, so they go from an earthly rest that it's a type of a heavenly rest that we're going to get in the future to those who belong to God. And certainly that is a reality, right? We wouldn't argue that. But why does God want me to wait to then until I get His rest? Why does God want me to wait until I get to heaven to believe Him? We know that's not true. Why would God want me to wait until I get to heaven to be faithful? He wouldn't want that. Why would God want me to wait until I get to heaven to really have a deep love for Christ? He doesn't want that. He wants all of this for me now. And He wants me to be able to enter into His rest 
today and tomorrow and next week and be relaxed and not be anxious. Be anxious for nothing. Well, if you're not at rest with God, you're going to be anxious about everything in your Christian life. And I, so I, I, I certainly agree that there's a final and eternal rest that's a reality for all of those of us who belong to God, but to come to that conclusion as the main emphasis of the rest here in Hebrews chapter 4 misses the whole point of the chapter. I mean, he says in verse 11, after giving this whole dialogue from verse 1 all the way through verse 10, he says, let us therefore be diligent to enter into that rest. He's not saying let us be diligent therefore to make sure that we're going to heaven at a later time. That's not what he's saying at all. He says in verse 10, for he who has entered his rest. I mean, this is something that's practical. It's something that's going on in the believer's life right now. The promised land was not somewhere in the sweet by and by without conflict or struggle. It wasn't. It, they had, you know, if you went to Joshua, it's divided up into those two sections in the first 12 chapters deal about conquering the land. It was a place that involved what I want to call God-ordained conflict. It involved God-ordained conflict in order to be able to enter into His rest. They were to go into the land, fight for the promised possession, conquer it so that they could enjoy what God had promised them. And there were, there were many battles. There were many spiritual conflicts ahead of them. Canaan was an actual place. It was a place that God wanted His people to enter into. But even though it was God ordained, it was not a place without conflict. And that's why I need God's rest. Because there's conflict. I need to know that God is greater. I need to know that God is sovereign. I need to know that God is in control, not a sparrow falls, that God doesn't know about it. And so God, it was a place that God had prepared for His people to enter into and to live abundantly, but only after they had actually entered and conquered the land. It was never, it was never a picture about heaven. It was about a place that God had prepared for them in the present. It was something He wanted them to enter into now. I mean, they're 40 years behind schedule already because of unbelief. And so, uh, there were many battles here. It was never about heaven. And these people continued to disobey God. They doubted God, they disbelieved His Word, and many of them never entered into what God had ordained and prepared for them. Man, if that's not a picture of the New Testament church today, I don't know what is. Christians who are just never seem to enter in to God's blessing and into the greatness of God's plan for their life. And with the exception of Joshua and Caleb, the whole generation... They just died in the wilderness. You know, that just seems... I, there's so many Christians, they're just dying in the wilderness. They got their nice cars, and they live in their nice suburban home, and they got all their nice furniture, and they wear nice clothes, and they got their Nike shoes, and they got all of their uh, Pandora uh, jewelry, and, and, you know, they got multiple degrees on the wall, and the mother's working, and the father's working, and... The kids have got all their electronic equipment and they're just living in the wilderness. They just never entered in. Just never, never entered in. Obviously, I think there was a specific reason why they never entered into God's rest. It was what the writer of Hebrews identifies as the disobedience and the unbelief of the people that kept them out of Canaan. Well, well doesn't that make sense to us? I mean, if you're going to sit around and think about it, doesn't that make sense to you that you're not going to enter into God's rest if you're disobedient to God? You're certainly not going to enter in if you're all the time questioning God and don't believe His Word, not willing to commit your life to His Word. 
the land was there, the blessings were there, the promise of entering victoriously was there, the grace to enter was there, but an entire generation failed to enter in because of unbelief and disobedience. And you know, I don't find anywhere in the New Testament, I mean in the Old Testament, where the people ever repented. You know, if the whole nation had just repented, I mean, if they, oh, I mean, they had just repented and cried out to God. You know, no telling what God might have done and let them enter in. They just, they complained about the manna, they complained about the quail. You know, they complained about the water, they complained about this and that, and they just never entered in. I know some Christians, all they do is complain. They don't like this, they don't like that. They don't like the time the church starts. They don't like the length of the service. It's too cold. It's too hot. You know, uh, they don't like, you know, this or that. They don't like the way the pastor parts his hair. Uh, I went to a church one time where I heard people complain they didn't like the, the pastor's hairdo. I, I mean, really. Uh, I've cut all mine off, so I, I, they don't have to worry about that. And... Uh, but there are a lot of people, they just complain all the time. Uh, they had all the opportunities that they, these people needed to believe. They had all the evidence, and yet they refused to trust God. This is the New Testament church in 21st century America, right here. They denied the miraculous evidence of the Exodus, their deliverance out of Egypt. Uh, I mean, you're talking about bondage. God delivered them miraculously God saved them at the Red Sea moved them into a place where he gave them a way of life gave them a complete culture the only revealed culture that's ever been given to anybody other than the church in the New Testament he gave them everything that they needed and they just completely rejected it built a cow built a cow out of earrings a calf and began to worship it while the mountains shaken there's thundering going on. It's, it's right there in front of them. And they still refuse to believe God. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 18 and 19 gives two specific reasons as to why they never entered in. It says, And whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? You know any Christians that are disobedient? So we see they could not enter in because of unbelief. Chapter 4, verse 3 says, For we who have believed, we enter that rest. You want to really enter into God's rest? Just take His word for what it says. Just be obedient to it. Hebrews 4, 6 says, Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter in because of disobedience. Well, what do you think he's talking about here? He's talking about disobedience, right? He's talking about unbelief. You can't enter into God's rest if you're going to be disobedient in your life and if you're not going to trust God and believe God. There are going to be times when you have to trust God. There are going to be times when there's no other way out. And it's, it's God's work in your life. It's not just a bad circumstance. It's, it, God led them to the Red Sea. Mountains on one side, Red Sea in front of them, you know, a pillar, of, a, a cloud... Pillar fire, and there's there's Pharaoh's army bearing down them. That's exactly where God. They were exactly where God wanted them to be, so that they could see the demonstration of His power. Verse four, uh, chapter four, verse eleven. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Disobedience, disobedience, unbelief, unbelief. That's what we're talking about here. What are we talking about? You got to get this right. We're talking about unbelief and disobedience. We're talking about three subjects. Rest, unbelief, and disobedience in these first 11 verses. Unbelief, disobedience, and God's rest. How do you, how do you enter into God's rest? It's through obedience. <laughs> you want to enter into it? You just obey God. Just do what God tells you to do. When you read something in God's Word, uh, you know, don't approach it with unbelief. Say, that's what God wants me to do. That's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to do. That's how you and I enter into God's supernatural rest. So, when speaking of this rest, it's not referring to heaven. We're not talking about heaven. 
You know what I think God would have done if we were talking about heaven? Just think about it for a minute. Rather than using the word rest, he would have used what word? Had he used the word heaven? Don't you think? Uh, there's no place. You're not going, this is the only place in Scripture right here where he uses the word rest. This is it. Well, if he was talking about heaven, why wouldn't he have said heaven? Because he's not talking about heaven. He's talking about you and I entering in to his rest. And so it's, it's something that God wants to give us here. If we will just obey him and believe him, it, it should be the norm for every Christian. However, and I think this must be understood, it's not without some level of personal effort, purposeful effort on every believer's part to be able to enter into God's rest. It's not something that's just automatic because I'm a Christian. I'd say it's not automatic. <laughs> you know, it, it's just simply not automatic. It's not something that you just get up in the morning and all of a sudden you're at peace. And you're at rest. If you don't believe God, if you don't trust God, you're just never going to enter into God's rest. And to emphasize this point a little bit more, what logic would there be in the author exhorting believers in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 11 to be diligent to enter God's rest if it was not something that they could enter into now? Why would he do that? I mean, God's not going to keep telling me to enter into heaven. He wants me to enter into his rest that he has for me now. God doesn't want me just every day just worry about, well, how's this going to work out? Or what's, what's going to happen? You know, somebody said something about this and about me. And oh no, you know, we don't have enough money in the bank. You know, how's, how's this all going to work out? I don't know. I don't have a clue, really. I don't know what God's going to do tomorrow. I don't have a clue. I don't know what, I, I don't know what might happen. And it doesn't matter. I don't have to. I can be at rest. I just know, hey, I'm, I'm trusting God. I'm believing God. I'm, I'm doing what I believe He wants me to do. And I'm, I'm, I'm just, uh, uh, I want to be diligent to enter into that rest. And certainly, the meaning is not to be diligent to enter into heaven. Right? Th th if you read that verse there in verse 11, it wouldn't make any sense. How would you be diligent to enter into heaven? God wants you to enter into his rest. And so, and he wants you to do it now. If the passage was referring to heaven, then for all practical purposes, purposes it would be telling believers to enter into it by their works. <laughs> by being diligent. Heaven's not something that's earned. It's a gift. So spiritual rest is something that God wants every believer to experience and enjoy right now and not later. But you can't enter into it if you're disobedient and if you're not willing to believe God, if you have an evil heart of unbelief. In Hebrews 4, I think there's some obvious assertions made about this rest. For instance, the first, therefore, in uh, uh, chapter 4, verse 1, points the reader back to the simple fact that there is a rest that remains for the people of God. Right? He's telling us, he says, uh, um, I mean, everything that we're talking about there is that there is a rest. There is a rest for me and for you. It's a promise. The fourth, therefore, in Hebrews uh, chapter 4, verse 11. Um, is that right? Yeah. Let us, therefore, be diligent defines that this rest is something that the believer is to be diligent to enter into. I can't be passive about it. I have to be active. I have to be what we called earlier. I have to be deliberate. I have to be intentional about entering this rest. You know, over the years, I, one of the areas that I feel that I've grown as a Christian, not that I am some courageous Christian. I, I mean, I, I just, I don't want to give that picture. But I just, I don't, I'm, I just don't feel afraid about things anymore. Uh, you know, I used to be a little bit more nervous about circumstances than I think that I am now. Uh, and, you know, it's not, it, it wasn't good. It wasn't good, you know, just being anxious about things. Uh, I learned a lot when my son was in Iraq. I mentioned that earlier. 
But if you put these two principles together, what it means is that God has made his children a promise, but it's a conditional promise. It's not something that you just enter into automatically. I, I, I have a part to play in all this. Oftentimes I make a promise to my grandchildren. I do this all the time that if they will do all their homework, you know, they have to bring their homework home every day. My, my, my youngest granddaughter that lives near us, she, she does this. She will pick her up at school and bring her home and she'll sit over there and do her homework. And my grandson, he goes to another school and uh, he'll come home and get on his four-wheeler. You know, there's a completely different thing. But I tell them that if they will, if they'll do good at, in school and do all their homework, that on Friday after school, when we pick them up, that I'll take them to a restaurant. We normally go to Chick-fil-A and they get a kid's meal or whatever it is there. I don't know what it is. They just love it. They, they can hardly wait for me to pick them up on Friday. But it's a conditional thing. It's a conditional thing. If they don't do, if they don't do their homework, if they've gotten bad grades on their test, then I'm not going to take them, you know? And so the point is that even though the promise is valid, it still depends on them doing the work at school. And there are specific conditions involved for every believer if they really want to be able to enter into God's rest. So, so what does all this represent for the believer in a practical sense? I mean, how can we make this practical? What is this rest that we're talking about here? And how is it that a believer actually enters into it? You know, just the word rest, you know, um, is a word that just carries the meaning of something that relaxes us and something that sort of rejuvenates us. Remember I was telling you, in one of the other studies, I really like to get out on my tractor. It, uh, it's, it's not physically, I don't rest physically. The tractor will beat you up. It, it's, you know, just because you're sitting down, that tractor is, is, is bouncing and, and you got to change gears and turn around and lift up the, you know, lift up the thing on the back or whatever it may be and put it back down and just head off again and it, it's, you got to keep it you got to keep it in alignment with the rows that you're cutting or whatever. But it's something that restores you and rejuvenates a person's strength. It's something that helps you to relax. Something that has great overall personal benefit. And apart from Christ, no lost person can have this rest. It's something supernatural. The rest that we're talking about is something that is reserved solely for Christians. Everyone will be restless until they come to Christ. Until they are able to rest in Christ and rest in the salvation that he has given to them. But in the context of Hebrews, it's important to always keep in mind what these Hebrews were enduring. Now just think about this for a minute. This is important. For them, everything in their life was the exact opposite of rest. It was the exact opposite of rest. They're having their goods taken away. Now how would you like it if the government came tomorrow and came and began, and began to take your goods? Uh, I read an article, I guess it was just yesterday, could have been uh, this morning, I, I don't remember, it was about a 10% wealth tax that they have, that they have uh, uh, decided to certain people that are in a certain income bracket, they're going to take another 10% of their money, a wealth tax that they're going to, that they're going to take out. So every, everyone's going to be restless, but here we understand that these Hebrews, we understand what they were doing. They were having their goods taken. They were being persecuted. Some of them were actually being killed. And so they were in a state of turmoil. You can just imagine what it's like in Iraq today. I don't think there are people just sitting in their homes and this going, ain't no problem, ISIS is coming, they'll probably kill our kids, everything be great. You know, hey, we're going to die, go to heaven. I, I don't think anybody's sitting, I, I wouldn't be sitting around like that. You know, if that was happening. Uh, maybe when it actually got there and it happened. Uh, I remember one time my wife and I went on a cruise, this was a long time ago. It was our first cruise and, and we got robbed. We were down in Jamaica and we got robbed. 
And it was really kind of interesting. There were about 40 people in this group, and everybody lost something but us. It was amazing. I'm sitting there. My wife and I have on, uh, just uh, a bathing suit. We were going to the Dun River Falls uh, before we got attacked, and, and uh, they were tearing jewelry off, and uh, the guy that's sitting beside us uh, refused to give it to him. God took the end of this automatic weapon and hit him right here in the chest. And he said, give him everything. The couple behind us was uh, from the Netherlands, and uh, they lost everything, their passports, their money, their credit cards. They didn't have a thing. I mean, they, you're talking about not having anything. This was pretty bad. And we're just sitting there, and the guy comes up to me, and I had about $60 on me and my pass to get back into the, into the, into the boat. And he came to me, and I lied to him. I just, he, said, I, he said, give me your money, man. And I said, I don't have any money, man. And I just kind of went like that. I don't have any money. He had a machete in his hand, a big old machete. I mean, he cut my hand off if he wanted to. And I saw those guys coming out the woods, and I kind of looked at my wife and just said, everything's going to be okay, sweetheart. I mean, I knew that they were, some people thought they were part of the, this little trip that we were taking, and, you know, they were part of the show, sort of like the Wild West show. <laughs> You'd have a, one of the beaches or something. And, uh, and it was almost like God just sort of put me into a kind of a spiritual umbrella, you know. Uh, and and I just I never got I was never nervous. I didn't I didn't I wasn't anxious. I just looked at him. It was almost like I felt just completely protected that that you can't do anything to me. I mean, not that they couldn't. I mean, they probably could have, but I just didn't feel like they would. You know, I was just at peace. God just gave me that rest at that moment. Now, when they left, my adrenaline started pumping, and I got more nervous after they left than I was before. My heart started beating really strongly, but God just kind of covered me. And you can just imagine what it's like for these Christians. What they were having to endure was monumental compared to what we have to endure, to say the least. And for that re very reason alone, I mean, these were people that had forsaken everything to follow Christ and it was costing them everything to continue to follow Christ. You know, we probably, there's probably not anyone that's listening to this video uh, that is, that has ever been through that. Uh, I have some, uh, a couple in my church that have, uh, they were missionaries for a good while in the Central African Republic in Africa. And uh, they had to be they had to be taken out of the country on like five or six different occasions where the rebels would come in and attack the people and the Christians and they would send in, uh, you know, they would kind of airlift them out or, or, you know, somebody would come several days ahead of time and get them and they'd have to just uh, just get stuff, put it in their bags and, and take off. I mean, you know, it'd be a while before they could go back into the country you know, and, but it's really neat to hear them talk about that, to talk about how God protected them during all that, and does that they never were afraid. Uh, I remember reading about some of the attacks that are going on in Iraq with ISIS. I was reading an article uh, two days ago about that, and how how uh, how some of the missionaries that were ministering to these people in the towns. They were the, the very towns that my son worked in, uh, and, and, and they were going back. They were going back there to help those people, even though that they knew that there was a chance that they could be killed. You have to be at rest to do that. You have to be at rest. There has to be something internally that's happened in your life where you can go and put your life and the life of your wife on the line. And you be willing to do that, to help people. Uh, no greater love has any man than he lay down his life for his friends. Uh, I got a picture uh, a couple days ago of a man that had been in Sierra Leone. And he was sitting, it was a picture of him sitting beside a lady that had become one of his prayer warriors. And she had died from the Ebola conflict. And so... Uh, it's important to keep in mind what happened to these people. There is no such thing as a no-cost Christianity. It does not exist. It's not a biblical concept. 
You cannot find that concept in the Bible. And the prevailing testimony of Christians all over the world is that of suffering and persecution and great uh, hatred towards them. The great fallacy and I think the ultimate deception of the American Christian culture is that it has portrayed the Christian life as something that's supposed to make believers comfortable and give them a life of ease, not trials and struggles. The liberal church at large has so advanced the false teaching that Christianity is some kind of spiritual cure-all for what ails a person that it's almost dumbfounding. The charismatic movement's infatuation with their health and wealth and name it and claim it gospel has reached a level of spiritual absurdity and error that is so absolutely staggering that it's difficult to even comprehend how they could glean any of what they teach from the Bible. Okay, we're going to stop there for just a minute. Uh, sorry I ran through that last part there quickly, but uh, we need to stop, and uh, we'll take up here in Lesson 10. Thank you.